all for joining us uh, here live or on YouTube afterwards. I'm Temple Northup. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Media Studies here at SDSU. And this webinar is part of a new series we launched this semester called Beyond JMS. And the purpose is really just to have conversations uh, about important topics related to media, media careers, uh, and things we think we should be having conversations about. And so I'm excited about today's and this amazing panel of experts that we've assembled uh, as today's conversation is about AI. And so I'm up here, not because I know very much about AI. Uh, and in, in a lot of ways, I'm here because I don't know a lot about AI. And so when my colleague, Amy Schmitz Weiss, who's on the panel suggested uh, a panel around this topic, I thought this is great. I think there are a lot of people who are probably as interested as I am is how is AI being used in the media today and thinking, you know, into the future, where are we going with it? And so just so you know, the structure of today, we'll start off by asking some questions. Everyone will introduce themselves. We'll talk for a little while. And then, of course, we'll open it up to any questions from you all that you may have on any of the topics uh, that we cover or, or things we don't cover. And so at any point along the way, you can drop thoughts in the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring those. You can put questions in the Q&A, and we will definitely get those uh, going. And so I want to start uh, with introductions so we know who, who everyone is on the panel. And we'll start with Amy Schmitz Weiss, who's a professor in the School of Journalism and Media Studies uh, in Journalism. And so, Amy, let me turn it over to you. And can you tell a, a little bit about yourself and what your connection or interest is with AI? Sure. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Professor Schmitz Weiss at San Diego State. Um, so my connection to AI is really looking at it from two sides, um, looking at it from the standpoint of scholarship and how it's having an impact on the way in which journalism is operating today and investigating that in a variety of different um, perspectives in my research. And then second of all is looking at bringing it into the classroom, of course, uh, really helping our students to understand how it's evolving from its role in newsroom production to distribution. You know, I think at this point, we're still really at the tip of the iceberg of what AI is going to do to the media industry and particularly to journalism. And I think it has a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, I think, you know, we also have to be aware of the challenges and the ethical issues that can arise with it. So I'm really excited for our conversation today so that we get a chance to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, thank you. And Yang Feng, who's another uh, professor here in the School of Journalism Media Studies, but in advertising, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Yang Feng. I'm Associate Professor of Advertising in JMS. My primary research focused on examining advertising effects in the algorithmic social media environment. So basically, I'm looking at how algorithms are changing the advertising landscape ethically and practically. Also, I'm very interested in AI and bring it to our classroom. So for example, I'm teaching a class that teaches students how to use Python to get data from social media and analyze the data in order to draw any insights for advertising practice purposes. That's pretty much about me. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we'll stick with the SDSU crowd first. Uh, and so Xiaobai, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, hello everyone, good morning. So my name is Xiaobai. Um, Associate Professor of Computer Science. Um, so we are running the computer vision lab. You know, it's kind of a sub area of AI. So our research kind of focus on so machine learning, AI, and the application in you know all kind of different applications, including uh, image, video, and also relevant to economics. So um, we are working with. I used to work with you know some colleagues from other department um, on the social media and data. Which I believe, which is maybe the you know closest topic to this to this webinar. So looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Dan, thank you so much. And last but not least, joining us from New York, um, although he works for the Washington Post, Lenny, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course, uh, I'm Lenny. I'm a data scientist at the Washington Post. I've been at the Post for three, three and a half years now. Initially, I was on the big data and personalization team where I sort of worked on more product side uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches. And then for the last year and a half, I've been on our newsroom engineering team, mostly focused on election coverage. Um, but we also build big data and 
machine learning tools for journalists to use. So I've seen, sort of seen uh, AI from multiple different angles in newsrooms. Fantastic. And so I wanted to start with you, Xiaobai, um, to just talk about what, what is AI? How does it work? What do we mean you know, when we're thinking about AI? For those who don't really understand it, perhaps like myself too much, what, what does that mean? What is it? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, um, I mean, so I just want to clarify, you know, AI is a really rather, you know, broad topic. So it's including, you know, so many areas, so many research topics. But I, I just talk about AI from my perspective, you know. Uh, I mean, I would say there are two aspects. So first in theory, so in document, if you look into the literature, the history, so AI is nothing but a Turing test. So you want to develop a computer system so that you can pass the Turing test. The Turing test, you know, everybody, you know, everybody watched the movie, you know, and you know, many years ago, it's like, you know, you have a machine, but you just want the machine think or act like, act like a human, okay? If the human can talk, you want the system to talk. If the human can read, you want the, you want the system can read. So basically there are so many aspects about the Turing test. I would say the Turing test, the one of the most criteria will be whether or not the, the system can outperform the human being for certain tasks. Let's say if you have a textbook, you know, you give the textbook to the kids, you know, in, in, K, in 12, you know, in K-12, then you give the book to the machine and then you ask them a question and then you ask them like, let's say 100 questions to see, you know, if the machine can outperform the human case. So that's really, you know, about the generic AI. But I mean, but this kind of, I would say the, the dream, okay? Everybody is working towards in this dream, but in reality, um, it become, you know, a, a, a fairly, you know, uh, I would say narrow down, you know, we try to narrow down the task. There's this, this, this system, this Turing system is so difficult to develop. You know, we don't really understand, the, you know, how the human are store knowledge. We don't really even know what is knowledge at all, you know, in human brains. So that's why, you know, it's so difficult. But in reality, so many people try to, you know, develop some, I would say the AI-like, you know, functions. It's look like AI, but actually it's not. I mean, just like, you know, if, for example, if you try, you, you, everybody using the Siri, you know, the Siri can talk to you, you know, basically they can, you know, listen to, you know, rec you know can recognize what words you spoke because they try to learn a function between, you know, the input data and out output label you, you care about. I would say it's AI-like, but all you can say is the basic, you know, function the AI system may have, um, but it also, you know, it's a part of the AI, but we have a lot of, we have a lot of, a lot of room to do, okay? So that's my two aspects. So regarding what is AI, you know, I mean, that's, that's really, um, but I mean, even for this, even for the, you know, basic form of AI, it still bring like, a, you know, so much power to, you know, to all different fields, including social media. I mean, so that's why you know we are we are sitting here to discuss that. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation, um, Amy. I'd like to go to you and think about how is AI being used in journalism today. Sure. Yeah, I think Lenny can also talk to this in a little bit as well. He's on the for front lines of it in the moment. Has been. Um, but, you know, I think we can see how much it's evolved over the years in terms of how journalism has adopted it. You know, you can look at it from the standpoint nowadays of resource allocation, news monitoring, um, the news automation process. It's helping in the realm of distribution mechanisms. We've got customer and subscriber acquisition underway with this, as well as data cleaning and curation for an enterprise and investigative stories. Um, it's involved in lead generation for reporters um, and for the newsroom. It's had its realm and its impact in fact-checking. Um, and so it's really had um, 
its fingers in everything in the newsroom in many ways. And it's interesting to see how different newsrooms are adopting different strategies um, over the years in terms of seeing what works and what they've had to pivot and what they've had to change to um, in those moments. And, and really looking at it um, from the sense of, you know, how can it help, I think in many ways, help free up journalists to do other aspects of their work that they may not typically have the time to do because they're doing a lot of the manual bits and pieces that may allow for them to have the opportunity to do something more than what they had time before to do. Um, but you, it runs a fine balance because you also have the other aspects of it of from resource allocation, maybe you'd have five reporters before doing a, you know, a certain beat. And now through the process of AI, it might eliminate four of those people out of the five. Um, so there, there brings a lot of challenges to it as well as opportunities like I was mentioning before. So. But we can see how it's being used across the spectrum in different parts of, of the US as well as around the world. I think we can look to different examples in other countries as to how they are also trying to figure out different ways in which AI can help in the news process from the back end as well as the front end and how the, the, the news consumer and the news audience um, gets their news. Wow, that's interesting. Um, and Yang, from your perspective in terms of advertising, how, how have you seen AI being used there? Um, so I think AI is changing the advertising landscape, especially on social media. So I would like to use two examples to talk about that. So one, I would like to talk about the recommendation algorithm used by many social media platforms. So think about many brands are using social media. They upload their own brand messages, for example, in the format of a video or a post. And traditionally, if you think about how to measure the effectiveness of those brand messages, you think about maybe we're going to look into the endorser they use inside the message and also the storyline inside the message, right? Those are more content related factors. However, within the scope of algorithmic social media environment, so it's not um, enough to only look at those content related factors. We have to look bigger into the context of the social media. So for example, recommendation algorithms can change you know, what people see on social media platform. So think about two brands. In, for example, both of them are plant-based meat brands like um, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. So think about one day you watched a video from Beyond Meat and the video actually used some keywords such as uh, uh, plant-based meat, uh, meat substitutes, eco-friendly meat, something like that. And then because of those keywords and the recommendation algorithm can also recommend you to watch another video from Impossible Foods uh, because that video also used very similar keywords uh, like, you know, like uh, the Beyond Meat one. So in this case, you can see that one consumer can be exposed to two competitors' videos. And in that, from that point of view, you can see that that can pose a threat to a brand's marketing practices, right? Because it's no longer based on your content. It's more also based on what kind of keywords you use uh, for your video and also what time you post your video there. And in another scenario is that the recommendation algorithm may also consistently recommend uh, content from the same brand because maybe the brand is very smart and they keep using very unique keywords that totally differentiate their videos, their content from their competitors. So the recommendation algorithm knows that, and then the recommendation algorithm will just keep recommending you the content from the same source. And so they can reinforce your loyalty to the brand. So you can see that in this case, the recommendation algorithm is changing the advertising practice. So when we do the planning, we shall not only focus on the content itself, but also thinking about the environment. In another scenario, I would like to talk about the comment ranking algorithm. So thinking about that, many people say that brands, when they upload their brand information on social media platform, they allow their users to make comments on the video and make it really interactive, right? And also many people applaud social media because they give us a platform to voice out their different opinions. But is that truly the case? Let me show you one example here. So thinking about many brands, they are trying to create social issue videos on YouTube such as those videos talking about gender issues or racial issues, some of the content can be really controversial. And you can see that initially, some people after they view such videos, they don't like it because you know, sometimes they just don't like to see many racial topics or gender topics. And they actually can post very flaming comments there. Those comments are really rude and also very aggressive. 
However, uh, so after that, maybe maybe some other viewers, after they view the video, they agree with this uh, flaming comments, they click the like button for those flaming comments. And so for YouTube, they have their common ranking algorithm. We may think that those common uh, ranking algorithm, they basically sort comments based on when they are posted. However, that's not the case because by default, if you don't make any manual change, YouTube will just present the comments based on their popularity status. And actually, we're not so sure how they rank them in terms of their popularity and how they define popularity because it's still not transparent to most of us, right? But at least a lot of scholars agree upon one thing, the common ranking algorithm, it takes into consideration the number of likes each comment receives. So that means if those flaming comments, they receive a lot of likes, they're gonna become the top comments posted below a video. Thinking about how many comments you really read. I once surveyed 100 people and they told me that most, actually most of them never read comments after the top 20 comments, you know? So the top comments actually play a huge role for them to think about the video there. And so if those flaming comments stay in a very top position, they are more you know, eye-catchy and a lot of people are likely to notice them. And they will think that, oh, other people really don't like this video. So uh, there's one, there are two outcomes. One is that one person maybe agree with those uh, flaming comments and keep the, and, and so the, the, the person may click the like button for those flaming comments and further strength strengthen their top position, right? In another scenario, a person may disagree with those flaming comments. However, the person may not uh, be likely to reply to them because, you know, I don't want to cause any trouble. <laughs> I don't want to be delegated. So I'm just going to remain silent. And as a result, you can see in the long run, um, those flaming comments will be stronger and stronger because they're going to accumulate more number of likes and they're going to stay in the top position forever. And that will just make more people, um, you know, less likely to express their different views. And one opinion becomes the dominant opinion there on social media platforms, right? So from that, you know, from another point of view is that for many brands, they are discouraged from generating videos that talk about gender issues and racial issues because they don't like to get backlash from their audience. So those are the two cases there. Yeah, thank you so much, Yang, for that, that thoughtful answer. Um, last but not least, once again, uh, and then we'll start bouncing around a bit more. Linny, um, can you tell us some, um, you're obviously the most in it professionally right now in terms of AI. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you're seeing it either at Washington Post or just more broadly within journalism right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have basically a split in how we use AI at the Post or machine learning um, generally. On the one side, we use it for products basically like internally. And that includes like metadata tagging engines. So topics for our pieces, you know, named entity recognition for pieces, noun phrase extraction, keywords, all of that sort of information that we need about stories that we want to sort of have with each story and it's metadata tagging. Uh, we do uh, bandit testing for headlines and images, for example, to sort of try and replace them and see how well they're doing um, on our, on our, on our uh, homepage. We've played around with a tool we call Heliograph which is a natural language generation where we try to automate stories, the actual writing of stories ourselves. Um, you know, some, it hasn't been quite as successful as we had sort of hoped, and we're sort of still experimenting in that world a little bit. Um, obviously, as Yang mentioned, we have recommender um, algorithms that we use. These often sort of use our, the metadata that we've, you know, extracted from the pieces for these recommender algorithms. Um, these are really like content-based recommendations, which we sort of then differentiate from like user-based recommendations. Um, and then finally, we also use it in advertising sort of very similarly, we want to link uh, content that's really sorry ads that are related to the content that the ads would appear in. And so similarly, we use the metadata that's associated with pieces and the metadata that's associated with ads to sort of link them together. So that's like on the product side, and I'm like very happy to sort of go into more detail on any of those. Um, but we've also sort of started trying to explore how to use artificial intelligence really in like with journalists together. Um, and we're sort of very early on in that phase. We're sort of, you know, very much experimenting here. Um, but the way I see it is that there are sort of three approaches to using artificial intelligence, specifically in the newsroom. Um, the first one is uh, what I call AI supported stories. And that's really where we build an algorithm specifically for a story. We oftentimes that means working very closely with journalists um, to try and sort of identify something, identify patterns and build a model that'll help them sort of report out a story. Um, so an example of that that we've had in the past two years has uh, we tagged, we 
uh, scraped all the social media uh, posts by the 2020 presidential Democratic presidential candidates and sort of ran a topic model over them to sort of try and explore what kinds of topics each of them are writing about on posting on social media about. And that was sort of for one specific story. I mean, it turned into like a, a bit of a series, um, but really we built the algorithm specifically for that story. The second approach uh, that we're sort of exploring we, uh, is called lead generation, where we sort of try and build an algorithm, have maybe a constant stream of data that's updating over time. And we use often outlier detection models, but sometimes even more, you know, more sort of straightforward uh, classification models uh, to try and find interesting pieces of information in data sets uh, that we then surface to journalists and they can then decide whether this is sort of worth exploring further. So it's really, um, you know, maybe trying to find a nugget of information that might be an, a useful lead. So that's like lead generation. And the third aspect that we're sort of trying to explore is we call the model is a story. And that's really where we show our readers the output of a machine learning model. Um, you know, it, I would say that's generally a bit rarer because, you know, it does need a lot of expertise. We need a lot of trust in our machine learning models to, if we want to be able to show them to readers like the raw output. But examples where we've done this has been our election forecasting model that I worked on over the last year, where we show our election predictions to our readers. Uh, another recent one we had was we worked together with epidemiologists at Yale um, to devise, or they devised an excess death, death model. And we sort of worked with them, but this, you know, included a pretty close cooperation. Like, you know, we looked over their code, we looked over their model, um, and sort of because we wanted to be sure that if we sort of promoted this work, you know, we were confident in what we were showing. Even though we weren't epidemiologists, we were able to sort of look at the code and sort of make sure that it made sense to us. Um, so I think that those are the three aspects in which I consider sort of using AI really with journalists. So let's say AI supported stories, lead generation, and uh, the model is a story. May I ask a question for Jenny, Lenny? Um, you, you mentioned you use the story writer, right? The AI for writing the story. Do you have a do you have an idea like whether or not your some of your colleagues, like a news reporter, will lose a job because of this in the future? If if yes, then how many years you you expect? <laughs> uh, I think we're pretty far away from that. I will also say like the way that I see it is like reporters are good at many different things and allowing AI or machine learning to write stories frees them up to do the stuff that AI can't do, which is report out a story. Um, sort of what you described earlier, right? The difference between the way we sort of, the way of what AI could be, which is sort of a very much sort of generalized machine intelligence and how it's used in practice, which is trying to solve one specific problem. Like we can make an AI being very good at solving one specific problem, like, you know, write a story, even though we're actually quite far away from being there. But like, technically I can see a, a path to being able to write coherent stories. I can't see a path in which we build an AI that actually manages to report out stories and interview sources and, you know, follow up leads and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, building AIs that will able to write stories well, will free up time for journalists to do things that, you know, artificial intelligence that, won't be able to do. Yeah, I'm not in the area of NLP, but I mean, in the past couple of years, you know, the GPT, you have a sh super powerful, you know, uh, you know, nat natural language model. So they, the model can be used to write a poem, you know, they can create some artist work, you know, it's super powerful. That's why, that's why I'm so interested in, you know, um, so, but writing newspaper, you know, could be really different from, you know, from the creating some arts, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one problem that we ran into in this case is that we need to, we, we can't just have an AI sort of write, sort of like GPT-2 does. We, we need a lot of control over what's being written, right? Like we need to make sure that the fact that is being written is correct. And we ran into a lot of issues with that, where sort of if you let a large transformer network just sort of write by itself or an LSTM, like it'll start just saying things that aren't at all correct. Um, and so we need a lot more granularity um, on like how much we can control what is being said or not. Well, and I think it gets to the point too of, you know, recognizing that there is a, a need for both uh, the human, <laughs> the, the human being to be involved in this process, right? And how the decisions are being made at the most granular level, level as to what's being put into the algorithm and the purpose and premise of it, but the ethics behind why it's being made, right? Um, before going off and putting it out into the world, right? And I think 
there's so much of that kind of debate happening in these moments because certainly someone could decide that they want to create a newspaper tomorrow online and have it all written by bots, right, and algorithms. But would that actually be legitimate? Would that actually be considered journalism, right, in these moments? Um, so I think that's kind of the other crux to this as well in that regard. Um, which kind of brings me to a, a question I want to I want to ask. Um, when we look at this um, specifically, uh, shall I, you know, when 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 folks are starting to create algorithms, do they take into account, you know, this ongoing issue that we now have, right? I and mean, it's been around <laughs> for centuries, but how much misinformation and disinformation can come into this, and, and how how might folks be able to address this when they're in the midst of of creating algorithms um, in this regard? Do you have any insights on this? The misinformation by in this context mean the like for example the fake news or mm -hmm. uh, whatever like a fake voice fake of audio you know for re most recently they can use like a AI model to create like a for example a fake fake video you know it sounds like you know like a President Obama you know you have you you see his video but he's talking but using you know someone else words you know but that's really can I would say it's a substantial improvement in technology because we can't really do this a couple of years ago, but we really bring a lot more challenge to this, you know, uh, to this social media. So I would say the misinformation, fake news, is a is the biggest challenge so so far. You know, if you look into the social media, so there are many research ongoing. They try to, um, you know, in AI, they try to detect, you know, fake news or misinformation. So there are, the algorithm, if you look into the, you know, the literature, there are two kind of, you know, uh, major, you know, methods. I mean, just give you some idea. So the first method is you look into the content of the misinformation. So then basically you compare the facts. So you have the NLP model, you look into the time, location, you involve a subject, then you do the you know, kind of reasoning between the between as a major factor. Then you compare to the ground truth, you, you know, story you already know. Then you can identify the fake news. But this one is a super challenge because you know the fake news is so trivial. When you talk to people, even you slightly change the you know the wording of your sentence, then it become you know close to truth, but it's not truth. So that's why you know. There are so many data sets, you know, in fake news. You know, if you look online, there are many public data sets. You know, I don't, I don't really see uh, they have a promising results so far. Maybe Lenny uh, can tell us more about this. But the second way, I, I would see is very, uh, it's more promising. So you don't, you don't look at the content, but you look into the transmission parts of the news, of fake news. But usually, the, the, you know. You will look into who will who is the creator, you know, who who is forwarding the you know forwarding the fake news over the social media network, and then who are who are reading this, they usually have a much better idea, you know, um, you know, for example, one of the you know generic idea, algorithm will be okay, so let's create a graph or network of all the social media users, and then um, the, so each node in the graph will represent a a user, and then the, the, you create some links, you know, between the user representing the, you know, for, for example, uh, the following, uh, unfollowing, you know, forwarding, tweeting relationship. And then over this graph, then you can definitely find out a, a transmission parts of the fake news. It's so different from the, the real, the true news, because they usually they have, you know, there's some, someone kind of unpurposely, so they try to, you know, spread the fake news over the, the network. And because some of the people, they don't, they don't believe the fake news, they, maybe they just ignore them or, or delete them. So if you look into the activity, see how the network react to this fake news, then you have a you know, better idea to tell whether it's, you know, it is misinformation or not. So that's, you know, basically I just try to tell, you know, from technical point. So they have this two kind of approach. But actually, the people concerned about the the impact of you know fake news a lot of more, a lot more than the technique, because they, uh, for example, I have a friend, he come to SDSU last year, you know, he tried to study, you know, um, you know the trustworthy problem in social media. So basically, 
uh, they want to understand, you know, if the user read the fake news, read the misinformation, how would this, you know, change the behaviors? For example, they look into the election. Okay, so how would, you know, if you put the one misinformation into the social network, you look into the transmission parts, then you know the idea. So you have a group of users who read this, you know, this fake news. Then you have another group of users who, you know, didn't read this fake news. Then you compare the behavior between them. Then you got some idea, you know, how this information affect, you know, you know, this election. So it's, it's kind of, you know, very interesting study. You know, I remember in University of Washington, they, uh, last year, they, they, they just create a center they call the, you know, misinformation uh, center. So they involve many faculty, you know, uh, you know, from very different background, you know, computer science, mathematics, you know, you know, theory, you know, try to try to understand this problem. But in general, I would say it's really in the early stage. You know, I mean, the fake news because it's, you know the, the impact doesn't show um, doesn't hurt us too much until uh, like uh, I would say um, eight years ago. You know, when basically when the generic uh, when the election, you know, the last time election, so the in two thousand sixteen, then the people be you know begin to realize wow the fake news actually greatly impact you know people's opinions you know and then. Uh, make a you know make a greater harm to our life you know so that's that's I mean uh, that's just my two cents my understanding about this problem yeah thank you and everybody um, feel free to start asking questions we'll start weaving those in uh, here as we talk and I have a question uh, for Linny although anyone of course is welcome to chime in and. It's about some of the concerns related to AI and, and really just learning almost too much about us. And so I'm curious, what is the balance of privacy versus using data to create a, an enhanced experience? And there's a related question that someone had specific to the post, which is just how frequently are these algorithms for recommending sources updated or, or changed? Uh, so you could answer that as part of just a, a bigger question of, of thinking about privacy versus, you know, a better user experience. Yeah, I mean, it's a real, it's a real problem. It's a real concern. It's something we think about a lot. And at the same time, I think don't think about enough. Um, I would say there's sort of a more general aspect here that's sort of unrelated to machine learning or artificial intelligence, which is like, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, personally identifiable information is out there and is being used for a variety of different things, even if it's not going into a machine learning algorithm. You know, the machine learning algorithm at least has the sort of benefit that the data is obscured in some way versus, you know, there are data sets that are floating around that are publicly accessible, not at the post, um, but other where that really shouldn't be. Um, and there are a lot of data sets that are out there that are legally publicly available and should be publicly available, like voter registration information and things like that. Um, that are really scary that these things are out there. Um, and so it is something we think about. The one way that we sort of deal with this at the post is that for recommendation, we really only use information that we have about the user's habits that they perform on our actual website. So we take people's reading habits and use that to inform the recommendation engine. And so we really have, you know, very limited information in terms of what we use. And we do that quite purposefully because we don't want to get into a situation where we're using data where if you know something bad happens that like, you know, we might have been responsible for leaking information that wouldn't be sort of that would be personally identifiable. Under like how often we uh, update our recommender engines uh, algorithms, we actually have multiple recommender alg algorithms that are running simultaneously um, that we sort of play around with depending on, you know which we think works well, you know, whether we're retraining ones, other ones sort of in the background. Uh, these are sort of different content ones, sort of from more simple to more complicated. There's wheels of user-based recommendations, like I mentioned. Um, I would say, you know, we sort of do a ground up reevaluation in my experience sort of every couple of years, but we definitely like retrain them on like a re very regular basis to make sure that, you know, we're still taking into account um, people's reading habits and things like that. I hope that answered the questions. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a question that I think uh, is related from the audience, which is what's the biggest danger of AI or do the benefits outweigh the perceived concerns? And I think that's definitely perhaps Yang, you might speak to that in terms of advertising, um, you know, but really any of you just thinking about cost benefit of of having all this information being used. Um, one real fear that I have is um, that we, for lack of a better phrase, like box people in. An AI, like an algorithm, especially on the classification level, works well when groups of users are separable in some way. We have a type user like this and a type user like that and a type user like this. And if a type falls into type one, then we show them that kind of content. If, if a user falls into type two, they, we give them that kind of content. Um, because we know that that'll, you know, they'll read that content. And so we have this incentive to make users fall into boxes quite neatly. And so we have sort of an incentive to show them more content that'll make, make them closer to one of the boxes or categories that they're already closest to. Um, and I think that's a real fear that we have. And it's something that we sort of try to actively, you know, counteract by sort of thinking about how we can diversify the content that we're showing people beyond sort of just recommendation. And also I would like to add that I feel like um, if used definitely if used properly, AI can bring us more benefits. But I feel I feel like the gap is we have um, a lack of conversation between scientists and social scientists. For example, you may hear a lot of social scientists talk about AI and ethics. But however, I think very few of us really understand the mechanism of those algorithms. So whatever suggestions you propose may not be feasible because of lack of the you know, mechanism of algorithms. Um, so I feel like we need to have more conversation between social scientists and scientists. So maybe social scientists can help scientists to build up better algorithms that can create more diverse uh, um, environment for all of us. Yeah. Um, I just try to add to that, you know, the AI, you know, even in its current form, is likely to determine what we will read every day and what we will watch every day. I mean, I mean, if you look, I mean, I use YouTube for example a lot. You know, so basically, for example, if I watch tennis games, then like couple game, couple couple very short videos, and then eventually, then the the whole the whole channel, you know, recommended by the YouTube will become tennis. So it's, it's which means it's really. It's, it's really um, not that smart, you know. Tennis, you know, is not all I want. So that we need they need to improve the recommendation. But I mean, but people are working on the algorithm, the AI algorithm. In the future, if the performance improve, if the AI can think about, can do some reasoning about this recommendation system, then eventually the AI will become, you know, the god. So who will decide, you know, what I will, uh, what I'm going to read? I know what I'm going to watch. That, that, that is the biggest danger, you know, of AI. Just imagine, you know, you know, you 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 have a you know, you use a Facebook, you use tube, YouTube. The CEO of the YouTube can determine like millions of people, you know, what they can do, you know, in the in, in daily life. So for I mean, we, we really have, you know, I I I kind of you know discuss this with a few you know, professors in the, in, the, in the area of AI ethic, you know. So basically for the current practice, they're more about using moral, you know, a good, good social contract, you know, to regularize these behaviors. But in the future, I definitely feel they, they should have some legal kind of, you know, uh, you know, some laws or some orders from the government, you know, to regularize, you know, you know, how, do, how could you guarantee this, you know, big IT companies, so they behave well, they don't. They don't sell our privacy. They don't. You know, they don't even try to control us. You know, that's that's the you know biggest danger in my mind in social media, particularly. Um, you know, why it's so important. It's it raised so many concerns in the past couple of years. Yeah. I have a, a question for Lenny. Um, you know, we're kind of talking about where things are are heading, right? And looking to what can be the future <laughs> in some ways. And so I kind of wanted to know from your perspective, Lanny, you know, there was a recent report that came out from Reuters that, that looked at how few C-level executives at this point across multiple industries 
um, don't really have a long-term strategy for AI. Um, and so, you know, what do you think might be some strategic directions that media organizations should be making now for their operations and, and the public that they serve. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, um, primarily sort of from my own experience, I think there's sort of a, it's it's hard to see where, from, from a top level approach, from like a C-level sort of approach, it's sort of hard to see where one can insert AI and make something better. Um, in my experience, the way it works is AI works best when it replaces a real sort of pain point for someone who's doing something. And that actually sort of in my experience works best when you sort of do it from the ground up. You find someone who's working in the process finds a, you know, a pain point and tries to relieve it using whatever process they might think is best. And in some cases that's sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence. And so I think the, the best sort of approach is empowering people to, to, to sort of use machine learning, to use AI, to use even maybe more basic sort of data pipelines, data gathering approaches to solving uh, real pain points Be beyond just sort of like from the top level going like, well, we wanna use AI to solve this problem. It's like, well, maybe AI isn't the best way to solve this problem. In fact, it's quite likely that AI is not the best way to solve this problem. Uh, it might look good and it might be a good press release, but you know, um, it might not actually be the, the best way of going about uh, solving the issue at hand. And so really like, you know, on the ground level, making sure that you have people who understand, you know, who can implement, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence solutions to problems, but also having an understanding of when those might not be the best solutions and who they should ask or go to, or maybe do themselves when they sort of realize it might not be the best solution. Um, and then making sort of these solutions viable to the people around. So making it clear to your employees that like a, a machine learning solution is good. If you find something better, all the better, but like, you know, you're sort of free to implement this yourself if you want beyond sort of just like a, you know, top-down directive, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I'll, I'll start asking some of the questions from our audience. Um, and, and Vivian asked the question is, do you think AI will replace a lot of jobs in the future? If so, what type of jobs will AI replace the most? Um, and then I would even add on a more positive view is where do you think there are jobs adding, you know, being added to the industry because of AI? Um, I would say some of, I mean, if you look into the application of AI, you know, for now, like a self-driving car, like, a, you know, for example, the security system, surveillance system, you know, it's most, it's kind of give us a clear, you know, clue that, you know, the jobs with the routine work, you know, it's likely to be replaced by AI first. For example, if it's a truck driver, you know, cab driver, you know, clearly they will lose the job in, in 10 or 20 years, you know. But if you look into the, for example, other kind of area, for, the, for example, the lawyer. So some of the lawyer will, you know, they don't, they don't really, you know, they do some kind of creative job. I mean, you, you can't really use AI or computer to replace, you know, your defending lawyer, right? So that's, you know, when you're talking about the, the you know, basically I would say, uh, for any job involve like, uh, you know, many like a reasoning, causality, you know, and many like creative works, then it should be very safe, you know, in the next, you know, decades. But for other works, you know, if you have involved like a very routine work, like uh, open the door, open the, you know, open the building, running the system. So essentially, eventually it will be replaced, you know, by AI or, I mean, when we, when we say it's AI, actually it's computer system or like, uh, for example, it's, it's, it actually go beyond AI, you know, you involve like a hardware computer system, you, you even including the computing, right? If you have like a, um, you know, GPU, like a large scale, you know, computing system. So you combine that with AI, then you can definitely replace many jobs in the future. So I have a question here for uh, us. Uh, so, so since we're talking about AI and jobs, so uh, my question is for students, for example, who are attending this webinar, what kind of skills, programs, and platforms uh, should they be learning in order for them to prepare for a future media career? What are your suggestions? I can, I can 
give my two cents first. Um, so AI is, you know, nothing but programming. Okay, if you want to get into AI, you need to learn how to code. So that's a that's that's my that's a fundamental you know starting point. Then doing programming is not you know computer science job anymore. You know, I mean, if you look into if you look around you know social media and the web. So now we are in the school, you no know, journalist. So you no, know, it's not in school of computer science, right? But actually, if you look around like many social media and department, you know geology, you know, electric, electrical engineering, everybody's programming. So programming is, you know, even my daughter, you know, six years old, six year old daughter, you know, they, they have a programming class, you know, how, how, how crazy they are. So programming is the first thing. Then the second lay, I would say there are some kind of a fundamental uh, AI course, you know, you want to take. Then basically, um, for example, you want to learn uh, machine learning, you know, that's kind of the most powerful, most successful, you know, AI techniques. And then you need to, um, you know, after that, then you can decide which area you want to go. But right now we don't really have a generic AI system. So most of the AI, they are kind of tailored to specific task. For example, if you work on, you know, text or language, then you probably you need to learn an NLP natural language processing. If you work on image or videos, you need to learn computer vision. If you work on data science, you need to learn data mining, you know, and data engineering. You know, basically, um, so the AI, you know, when you put them, you know, when, you, when they come to your life, you know, that's no AI, that's just this, you know, AI area and the different AI task, you know. What do you think, Lenny? Do you have any insights to share? <laughs> um, well, sort of not really beyond that. I mean, like they, I don't, I'm not a journalist. I'm not in the, in the newsroom, even though I'm quite newsroom adjacent. Um, I do sort of think that a lot of sort of the very much traditional reporting skills, writing skills, journalism skills aren't going away anytime soon. Um, but I will say a, a good understanding, especially if one is interested in reporting about AI or using AI in sort of your reporting, which I, I, and I do want to separate those two. They are, I mean, oftentimes we sort of mix them together when we talk about sort of AI and journalism. We often talk about journalism that is reporting about AI, but I do think they're quite separate. But what does combine them is that one sort of has to have an understanding of what is possible, what is feasible, even if, you know, you can't design an algorithm yourself or you can't program the algorithm yourself, sort of having an understanding of like, you know, this is a problem that AI might be able to solve. This is one that it should, can't, isn't able to solve, this is one that it shouldn't be able to solve. And sort of being able to sort of differentiate between those and play around with those, I think is helpful. I mean, kind of no matter what, as sort of, you know, artificial intelligence becomes more ubiquitous, um, being able to sort of understand where, where we interface with algorithms, how these algorithms might be working, that's always a good skill, I think. I also want to add something. I agree with um, Xiaobai and Nani. Uh, I feel like uh, especially programming language is important. For example, like Python uh, maybe is one of the most popular programming language that is for everybody. But also I feel like um, for, uh, let's say, journalism and advertising students, you may not necessarily need to be an expert of AI in terms of understanding all the mechanism, mathematical formula behind the algorithm. But at least you can have some conceptual knowledge of those different types of algorithms like machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing. Uh, I think uh, for journalism and advertising students, it's important for them to use their domain knowledge to create classification scheme for uh, the, the scientists to use. For example, what defines a true news? What defines a fake news? Based on their domain knowledge, they can come up with some classification scheme for data scientists, for engineer, for computer scientists to execute. So I feel like that's something important to also explore. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. An example of that is like, you know, we're recently sort of reevaluating our topic, like modeling in general. And so we're working closely with like taxonomists on like, you know, thinking through what that might look like, because even though I might, you know, build the algorithm behind it, I don't know what a successful taxonomy looks like um, or, you know, how to make sure that taxonomies that we might be using might be good to use and things like that. So that's, that, that is really, really important. Like on the, on the thinking through what an objective is on AI, on the like data gathering side of AI, I think there's sort of a lot of place, a lot, a lot of space for people to who might not, you know, be the person actually building the algorithm to to, to contribute. 
I just try to follow Lenny uh, and Yang's you know, points. I think that's a huge difference between nowadays AI system and comparing to even five years ago. Because five years ago, they, we don't really have so many API platform. We don't, we don't have so, you know, you have, you know, if you want to use AI, let's say use machine learning, you have to do that from scratch. If you want to use a GPU, you need to do the, you need to understand what is the parallel computing, then how to do the programming over the, you know, the GPU. But nowadays, look around, you know, they have a TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, you know, all kinds of, you know, toolbox. So it's so simple. I mean, you can directly use them, you know, without even understanding what's going on inside. So I don't, so, I mean, coming back to the question, say, I would say, you know, when you try to learn the AI, so you really need to position yourself. So which position, you know, which role you want to become in the future. So if you really want to become a user of AI, so just don't, don't be hesitant and you just try to try to learn this toolbox, you know, it, it's not so difficult. Then, but if you want to become like a professional, you know, developer like Lenny, you know, so then probably you need to dig into the box. You know, you want to open the box. You don't want to use the, you know, you, you, want, to, you don't want to use the, the tool, but without understanding the theory, right? So, but, you know, for that direction, I would recommend that you need to take, for example, programming course, you need to take the machine learning course, you need to spend tremendous efforts, you know, on learning the underlying theory and algorithm. So this will, you know, make, make a whole different story. I want to throw a bunch of questions together because we've had a lot of questions sort of in the same area. Um, and so feel free to pick out any any particular nugget that you're you're interested in. And so one question is, is there a good entry level book for to learn more about sort of AI, AI generally or AI in the media? Uh, kind of related is if they were going to learn one language, what should they learn? And a and, uh, person was guessing Python. And then, uh, and you've sort of answered this, but do you think JMS students, more broadly speaking, should take statistic more stats classes or more programming classes just to get a deeper understanding? So that's a bunch of questions rolled into one, but I think everyone can probably hop in on, on some part of that. Yeah, so I can quickly say that uh, our basic, basically our entire machine learning stack is in Python. Uh, we do have some stuff in R, um, but yeah, by far most of it is, is is in Python. I will say that I will separate. You know, there is sort of the more data analytics analysis path in data science. I would say that's more focused on R. The actual like putting things in production, machine learning in production is more like Python. Uh, whether people, should, I mean, I'm biased, but I think everyone should take statistics classes. But you know, that might be my own personal preference. <laughs> So I just post the link. Um, so that's an AI club. So we are running uh, at, on the campus. So, so they have a, like a weekly meeting. So if you have interest, uh, you can definitely go to them. So they have um, many very, uh, I would say it's very, very high quality, you know, introduction course. And most importantly, it's a free. Okay, so it's open to everybody on the campus. So then uh, you're speaking of the, if you want to learn that, you know, on your own, uh, there are many courses, you know, on uh, Udemy, on uh, Coursera, you know, just take advantage of the Marco, right, the online education. It's not uh, so expensive, you know, but if you want to talk to people and working on some, I would say just one point, you know, it may be, you know, we have too many education resources, you know, but I mean, when you try to learn AI, just keep in mind, it's, it's a really engineering area. So you can't really learn AI without doing a project. So you have to, you know, keep in mind, you know, you, you want to work on some real problem, you know, on some data set. So you want to actually solve the problem by, by using whatever you learn from the course, from the, you know, from the, uh, the AI club, you know, basically a project is going to be the number one thing will, you know, will sharpen, sharpen your skills. Then speaking of the project, you know, Basically, there are two kinds of projects. So one is, you know, education project, right? So they are well, you know, well developed, well clean. There's no like a hassle, you know, that's, you know, the data is coming in without missing labels, you know, and you can use it in your course. 
The second type of data will be the real world data. You know, you, perhaps Lenny can tell us a little bit more about this. You know, the data is so noisy. You perhaps, you know, to complete a project like a social media project, you probably need to spend like 80% of your time on cleaning the data, maybe even more. So that is the dirty, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, expertise you have to learn by actually working on this project. Okay, so that's just my, I, I guess, you know, the AI club right, right now, so uh, we are, we focused on uh, two things. One is, you know, we have some introduction costs, but most importantly for now, we are running the, like a weekly project, you know, uh, hackathon. So every, every other, every two weeks, so we, we, I try to identify an AI project, you know, then everybody working on that, then uh, by the end of the period, so you can talk to each other, you know, uh, say what you have done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Jonathan Soma, thank you for posting uh, that link in the chat. So people who are who are wondering about where to start, uh, that seems like a really nice collection of things. So we're almost out of time. So I'm going to do one more quick loop around everybody. Uh, and just maybe, I mean, it could be final thoughts, but maybe also just what, what are you most excited about if you're projecting out 10 years of where you think AI is going and in any of these areas, what, you know, What's one area of uh, excitement for you? For me, you know, I've I've come to have a really great uh, relationship with Alexa, and so I just see so much potential in in having these these devices that will get to know me and know me so well that it makes my life easier. Um, but uh, Amy, we'll start with you. Uh, anything that gets you most excited? Yeah, well, um, something that I've been working on as well over the years is spatial journalism, and so. Um, actually just reading about Lenny's work and working with location-based uh, algorithms. So I think there's, you know, one of the things I think is that, you know, bringing the news uh, closer to audiences in the places and spaces where they are, I think is one of the exciting things in, in addition to a lot of the other stuff that we've talked about. So I think that's another um, exciting realm that can be examined in the coming years ahead and, and how that might connect communities together more um, in some way, so. Yang, would you like to uh, look into yeah. the future? Personally, I'm very positive about AI. I love AI. I, I have a lot. I have several actually Google Home devices, and I cannot live without them. <laughs> um, and I, like I said, my perspective is always like uh, like that. If used properly, I feel like AI can definitely bring more benefits to us than harms. Um, for example, the recommendation algorithms and the common ranking algorithm algorithms can definitely be improved and and give us a more diverse. Um, and well, an inclusive environment for us to express diverse opinions and also to see diverse content on social media platforms. Thank you. Xiaobai, how about you? Um, looking into the future, so given the popularity of AI, I guess I don't really need to worry about my job. You know, I, I could still have my research going on. This kind of a two, uh, two, it means two things. Uh, so first, you know, the people begin to see the real impact of AI, which is positive. Secondly, the people begin to see the shortcoming of AI. You know, basically, you see, uh, you know, while you are enjoying the benefits of AI, you know, you also see a lot of challenges like fake news, and then you see the the recommend recommendation system doesn't really work like a human. It's not so intelligent. You know, so that's a bigger room to improve. So that's why you know. I mean, that's a big room, you know, uh, to work in. Yeah, in the next 10 or 20 years, even before I retire, you know. Okay, thanks. And Lenny, what about you? Uh, one thing I'm really excited about is sort of future work in supporting investigative journalism. Um, so that's sort of basic digitizing data sets, making more data sets publicly available to more journalists. Um, you know, that's very basic, like optical character recognition, which is a form of AI and improvements that are happening there. Structured text extraction to make it easier for journalists to search forms and tables and sort of being able to combine these multiple data sets that used to be disparate, um, where you can sort of compare campaign filings to whatever, maybe something else. Um, I think there's some really exciting sort of improvements happening there and will be sort of for the next, you know, foreseeable future. And that's something that really excites me. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you to our panelists for this really great conversation. Um, for anyone who we didn't get to questions to, um, we're all here. We're obviously, you can find us all uh, through Google. Uh, we'll very easily find us uh, and you can connect with us if, if you have any questions. Um, whenever we close this here in just a second, everyone who's logged on is going to get a survey. That survey is being uh, conducted by some of our PR students. So if you can take three minutes to complete that, uh, we'd love to get your thoughts and opinions about what we're doing. Otherwise, have a wonderful Friday. And thank everybody for joining us um, and have a great day.